So before introducing our uh, distinguished uh, speakers today, I'd like to make a, a land uh, acknowledgement. Uh, University of Ottawa Heart Institute acknowledges the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe and the peoples of Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Uh, we recognize all the indigenous people in the region from nations across Canada who have also made Ottawa their home. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. We dedicate ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of partnership and reconciliation, and together we take responsibility for the heart health of all peoples in the region. And indeed, the past Saturday uh, was the National Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. And uh, this uh, particular day is not just a, a reminder of a difficult past, but an opportunity to acknowledge, understand, and address the profound injustices uh, Indigenous peoples have endured, uh, particularly the devastating impact of the residential schools. And uh, we are privileged today to have in our presence uh, two esteemed uh, indigenous scholars who really embodies resilience, wisdom, and an unwavering spirit of indigenous communities. Their leadership not only is a source of pride, uh, but an inspiration for all Canadians. And they remind us of the power of truth and the importance of ensuring that every child counts. And uh, our speakers are really um, our collaborators as well. You know, they are leaders in the field. Uh, Professor Alexandra King is the chemical chair in Indigenous Health and Wellness at University of Saskatchewan. She's a citizen of Nipissing First Nation. She's the internal medicine specialist that focus on HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, and metabolic diseases. She graduated from University of Toronto with MD degrees, subsequent internal medicine training at University of Alberta and UBC. And she taught courses in indigenous health at Simon Fraser University and particularly mentored the faculty in terms of implementation of their responses to the truth and reconciliation uh, call for action. And uh, Dr. King's practice grounded indigenous philosophy and focused on the care of these patients for which First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people particularly bear a disproportionate consequence. And she's a principal investigator on multiple CIHR and uh, public health agency grants, and also part of, of course, our Brain and Heart Interconnection Project. And her research particularly um, is revisioning an indigenous um, community-directed research, so it's centered on indigenous ancestral wisdom and the lived living experience as well indigenous research philosophies and methodologies. And uh, Professor Malcolm King is a scientific director of the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research. Dr. Malcolm King is a member of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation and is a health researcher at University of Saskatchewan. And uh, as a scientific director of the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research, he continues research in indigenous health with a particularly focus on wellness engagement. Previously, Dr. King led the CIHR Institute of Aboriginal People's Health as a, its a scientific director, spearheading the development of national health research agenda aimed at improving wellness and achieving health equity for the First Nations people, Métis and Inuit in Canada. And I had a privilege of working with Dr. King closely at CIHR on several collaborative uh, research projects and learned so much from him. Dr. King's international indigenous health interests include improving indigenous health through workforce development and provision of culturally appropriate care and developing indigenous health indicators to monitor progress in programs aimed at achieving wellness and health equity. We're particularly proud to have Professor King's as principal investigators who are was our brain heart interconnectum CEFREF program to lead the research on indigenous health. And uh, I think they suffered as much as all of the other PIs in terms of submitting the grant last Friday. And uh, working closely also with Dr. Emilio Arlacan, 
uh, Joe Irvine, Dr. Ruth Slack, and many other PIs, uh, you know, such as those uh, in the audience here, like Jody and Kelly. And uh, they uh, help us to move forward on the indigenous health research uh, for uh, us all together. So uh, thanks, uh, Alexandra and Malcolm, for uh, really leading us in this field and uh, addressing uh, with us today on the topic of making every child matter in 2023. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Peter. It was uh, very kind of you to uh, introduce us uh, in such a fashion. Um, Malcolm, do you want to start sharing your screen? We can see your email. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so Malcolm is going to be controlling the slides and we're going to rotate back and forth over presenting. Um, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for being here today and uh, really hope that uh, what we present uh, will help to make some sense of where we are now. Uh, next slide, Malcolm. Um, so we have the privilege of working mostly virtually on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis in what has become known as Saskatchewan. Um, Malcolm has the privilege of living on his own territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and this is where he grew up, and so he's now back home. I'm actually a guest on these territories, and I really work hard to be a strong ally uh, to the Mississaugas of the Credit, and I'm very grateful to the host nation for their uh, hospitality. Uh, the objectives of our presentation is, um, you know, really considering reconciliation, how we got to where we are now, and how do we engage with Indigenous people and uh, uh, become good allies. And of course, there's a question around where does Orange Shirt Day fit in, and it is now known as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, it's really not just a federal ho uh, holiday, but an opportunity to participate in meaningful engagement with Indigenous people and become a better ally. And so on the next slide, um, what you will see are my maternal grandparents, uh, Desmond and Mary on the left side of the screen and the baby that they're holding is my mom. Um, Desmond was Algonquin from Tenesquim First Nation, Mary uh, Nipissing from, uh, uh, sorry, Anishinaabe from Nipissing First Nation. And um, on the right side of the screen is one of our grandchildren. And one of the reasons why I put these two pictures together is that uh, our teachings are that we are walking in the footsteps of our ancestors and must live up to their expectations and dreams, but also um, we are to become ancestors for the next generation. And so I'm always thinking about what we are leaving behind for those who follow. Next. Um, Malcolm, you have to unmute. Uh... And PowerPoint went off altogether. You're muted. Yeah. Yes, okay. Now I'm uh, unmuted and uh, and I'm sorry that uh, it uh, went off. Uh, there we go, almost. Yeah. And yeah, sorry for that delay. So this is uh, a much more complicated uh, family picture, but it really, uh, it, it is six generations. It's generations back and generations forward. But like Alexandra, in the middle of the picture are my late parents, Lloyd and Margaret. Lloyd lived all his life here on the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. My mother, Margaret, came from Switzerland. And I won't spend a lot of time, but it does go back to my great-great-grandfather in the upper left corner, Chief George King. And looking forward, 
These are our two granddaughters. You saw the picture of one in the previous slide. She's now almost four. And then there's the baby Maeve down in the lower right corner who was just born in June. And uh, that's uh, our forward and backward. So a, a very brief overview of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, you can see these pie charts with the red indicating the percentage of Indigenous population by province and territory. Overall, Canada has 5% Indigenous people, that is First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And you can see in the middle, Ontario, where we are, uh, has only barely 3%, 2.9% overall, but it actually has the largest numerical number, 400,000 self-identified Indigenous people. In the far north, Indigenous people are a uh, much larger percentage. They're uh, even 86% in the Nunavut territory, but the numbers are small. Uh, the other uh, slide about uh, of Indigenous populations in Canada is the age profile. And you can see that the Inuit and First Nations in particular, but also Métis, are much younger population than Canada's uh, overall population, which you can see here is really quite flat in uh, age profile up until late middle age, and then uh, things fall uh, off for both uh, women and men. Whereas uh, for First Nations and Inuit in particular, there's much higher birth rates, uh, so larger numbers of uh, children and youth and correspondingly shorter lifetimes, so uh, relatively few uh, elderly. Uh, I'm back over to Alex. Yeah, thank you. So Malcolm and I were talking about how um, we could help people navigate through some of the terminology. And we thought we'd start with some definitions uh, or, you know, um, providing some definitions as we go through. And so one of the things that we talk about is colonization. And uh, there's a definition here. I just grabbed it from York University. There are multiple definitions about colonization, but this one seems to be quite reasonable. Uh, next slide, Malcolm. And so back when the Europeans came to North America, um, this was sort of uh, what they encountered. Some of us refer to it as Turtle Island. And um, what you can see is that our territories were irregularly shaped and um, often, uh, you know, uh, were uh, um, conforming to the landscape. And so sometimes there would be valleys, they might be uh, plains, they might be uh, a variety of different sizes, just depending on what the land around would support. Um, they can at times be overlapping and um, they do shift over time as well. Uh, and, and this was very typical of what was going on. I think this um, cartoon also captures the diversity or at least some of it uh, amongst indigenous people um, throughout uh, this is North America and down into uh, Central America. Uh, next slide, Malcolm. Thanks. So when the Europeans first came here, they were really interested in extraction of resources. And what you can see is that in 1603, there was the great alliance uh, that was worked out between um, the uh, First Nations in Quebec and um, the uh, Europeans who came there. And um, they have here uh, a rock that uh, is saying quay, which is uh, the word for a uh, friend. And um, the, sorry, that means welcome. And on the other side, there is uh, the word for friend. And so you, what you see here is an alliance between equals. And this was done to allow the Europeans to be able to come and be on these territories. Next slide, welcome. Uh, what we also, um, and, and probably it's better known, uh, there was another treaty that was made in 1613. This was in what was um, to become Upper New York State, and it was between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. And um, it's known as a two-row wampum belt by uh, many Indigenous people, also known as Gaswenta. And um, so 
the two rows represent uh, boats, the one being a canoe, um, uh, which uh, symbolizes the indigenous people, and one being a sailboat symbolizing the European people. And what we can see here is that the white represents a river that we are continuing to go down together, that we are in parallel. This is a treaty of non-interference, of mutual respect. And um, even on Saturday, which was the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, we had an elder talking to us about it. Oh, sorry, Malcolm. And, you know, she was saying that um, the treaty doesn't include uh, an out clause. There isn't an out. We continue down the river together. And so it's up to us to be figuring out how do we do that in a good way. Okay, uh, next slide. So continuing with the brief history, and Alexandra said the early colonialism was uh, based on, on uh, resource extraction. So famously, the uh, English king uh, created the Hudson Bay Company in 1670. Actually, it was his cousin, Prince Rupert, who uh, uh, was the lead uh, interest in this. And so they were rivals, the English and the French, for more than 100 years, maybe almost 200 years uh, in resource extraction. And uh, as you all know, uh, eventually the English uh, conquered uh, Quebec. And these are the two generals at the time, Montcalm and Wolfe, who both died in that Battle of the Plains of Abraham. But as of 1760, then the, the English, the United Kingdom, uh, became the main European uh, power in North America, and there no longer needed uh, that, that, that strong alliance with uh, their indigenous partners. Uh, but uh, the new king of uh, England, who came on in 1760, uh, George III, made this uh, royal proclamation just three years into his reign and basically ascribed to himself and his agents the right to negotiate uh, for land, for treaties uh, with Indigenous nations. It also, though, is very important, it recognized that uh, any lands that hadn't been ceded or subject to territories were but still the uh, belonged in, in the European sense to uh, First Nations. So it recognized uh, the, uh, the, the right of uh, ownership as the Europeans saw it. Uh, of course, First Nations never saw us, we never saw ourselves as owning uh, land. But uh, the, this, uh, then we got into the era of settler colonialism. So this is another uh, definition from York University, where this is a different kind of colonialism. It's uh, and and it, it came with uh, seeking to impose the will of one people on another and to use the resources of the imposed people for the benefit of the imposer. So settler colonialism is when outsiders came to land inhabited by indigenous people and claim it as their own. Uh, back to you, Alexandra. Hey, thanks. So um, this is a map, uh, a cartoon that is showing that at the time that Canada became a country, um, the white part, uh, Malcolm, maybe you can highlight it with your cursor, um, is all that was Canada. So um, it was known as Upper and Lower Canada, um, and it was basically Ontario and Quebec and a bit of the uh, Atlantic Canada. Um, you can also see that the area around Hudson's Bay is known as Rupert's Land, and then we go up into the Northwest Territories and into British Columbia. It was really important for Canada as a new country to be able to have people living on these lands uh, because otherwise they were worried that uh, the U.S. would end up coming up and taking hold of them. And so therefore, there was a great impetus on the part of the Canadian government to uh, start negotiating treaties. 
And so if you can go to the next slide, thanks. And so this is where we get into the numbered treaties. And so we actually start in and around Winnipeg with Treaty 1 area and expand out from there. But it was in very rapid succession that the federal government was going around and negotiating these treaties with a variety of uh, First Nations. Importantly, and Malcolm, maybe you can highlight Treaty 6, just putting your mouth around it. These treaties, as you can see, actually um, span across different provinces, and that's because they actually preceded the provinces. So afterwards, then um, we started uh, laying down the provincial um, borders and so on. And so that's why uh, we have treaties that span across. Again, trying to follow the um, typical communities and so on that Indigenous people found themselves. So then in 1876, as one of the first acts of uh, the new uh, country, um, the government implemented the Indian Act. And so this is something that I, many people don't realize how sweeping it is, but it defines who is and who is not recognized as a status Indian. And what's important is that when we look at Indigenous people in other countries, many of them define for themselves who has um, who is Indigenous. And so this is something that the federal government is still determining for us. It outlines rules for governing the Indian reserves, and importantly, it is creating uh, those reserves for us. Uh, we were considered minors under the law, and so we were not allowed to engage lawyers, um, and we needed permission to uh, leave the reserve or to return it. And so, in fact, in Canada, we had one of the earliest past systems that then was exported to other countries, such as South Africa. Um, we had policies uh, that were enacted under the Indian Act that included gender discrimination in the residential schools, bans on religious ceremonies, restrictions on education um, and access to counsel, as I've already mentioned. And um, informed consent was actually under the purview of the Indian agent who uh, really sort of ruled uh, the reserve uh, for which they were responsible. Uh, next slide, Malcolm. Um, and so what we can see is that uh, there was a strong interest on the part of the federal government to absorb the um, Indigenous people into the uh, body politic uh, that was becoming Canada. And what they realized is that it became increasingly important that they um, take children from families because they uh, appreciated the influence that families have on uh, the children. And uh, they go on to say, you know, if we want to get rid of, um, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Uh, I do not think this is a um, matter of fact that the country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. And so their objective was to continue until there was not a single Indian in Canada who had not been absorbed into the body politic. And there is no Indian uh, question or Indian department. Next, Malcolm. So, um... One of the worst uh, aspects of the uh, Indian Act was the establishment of Indian residential schools. These uh, began in 1876 uh, and uh, continued uh, through until 1996, uh, the last one uh, in Saskatchewan. They were predominantly funded by the government, but operated by the churches, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, and United. In 1920, that was uh, at the time of the uh, uh, the the Indian agent uh, mentioned in the previous slide, they made it mandatory for every Indian child aged 7 to 16 years to attend Indian residential school. But in fact, children were typically taken away from their families uh, at age 4 or 5 when they were extremely vulnerable and put into residential schools. And uh, the, the legal guardianship of Indian children actually became assumed by the principals of the schools. And uh, parents really uh, lost uh, any say in uh, their children's upbringing, and including language and culture. Uh, here are some pictures. And this pair of pictures is a uh, pictures of a young boy in Saskatchewan in the uh, in the 19th century. Uh, here he was in his uh, 
uh, his uh, dress uh, prior to school, and this is the result after education. In the and and that was the ideal to kill the Indian in the child. Um, the residential schools were already known, even back in the early 20th century, as places that were unhealthy. The death rates were uh, known to be high, and uh, tuberculosis was the major killer, but there were many other reasons. And these are the official statistics showing the excess death rates uh, in uh, residential school versus the general population of, uh, of, of children ages 5 to 14. And, of course, the, these went down over the years uh, to very low levels, uh, which we have in Canada. But you know, over most of that time in residential schools, they were much higher. And they even started to go back up again, even in the 1960s. But this is what we know of death rates from the official statistics. Uh, we'll talk about more later, but we're finding out a lot more with uh, discoveries of uh, unmarked uh, graves. And finally, we get to one more definition, coloniality. And by the way, these slides would be made available to you, and you can uh, explore these uh, web links yourselves. And so it refers to the control and management of knowledge by what are considered universals by Western society, modernity, Eurocentrism, global capitalism. And these practices are deemed normal, if you like, neutral, universal, and apolitical, but they've led to the erasure of entire knowledge systems, not just in North America, but elsewhere in the world. Uh, Alex. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that um, happened once the residential schools started closing was that we saw the uh, federal government under transfer in agreements with the provincial governments, First Nations children were increasingly placed into foster care. Um, many of the children were taken from their home communities and raised away from their cultures, language, and uh, extended families. Uh, we know of uh, people who were split up from their siblings. Some of them were uh, raised down in the States or in Europe and uh, certainly miles and miles away from their home communities. This is known as a 60 scoop and many of the children that were involved have never reconnected and may not be able to reconnect with their home communities. Um, but the 60 scoopers, as some of uh, them call themselves, they talk about the trauma of disconnection and really it bears a lot of similarities to those in the residential schools. Now we move forward to today and this is from uh, 2021 census data. And what we can see is that 53.8% of the children in foster care under the age of 14 are Indigenous. We make up 7.7% of all children under 14, and yet 53.8% of children in care. Now, one of the things that is really difficult for Indigenous people is that our children are being taken from us, and we're being told it's because um, they'll be safer in um, foster care. And yet what we are seeing, and this has been coming out for at least the last five years, maybe even decade, is that the children in care are suffering. And so in Saskatchewan, what we saw was that there was a spike in deaths during 2019. And um, of 34 deaths, 29 um, of the children in care were, uh, who died were First Nations or Métis. Um, there's a five-year average of 21 deaths per year, and in uh, 2019, it spiked to 11. Um, and uh, or, and the, these uh, 11 of them were less than five years of age. And when you are looking at the different reports as to why the children died, they're talking about like unsafe sleeping practices, uh, suicide, self-harm, and there were two that were actually recorded as homicides. Um, it's not only in Saskatchewan, there was another article in Alberta that was talking about four to five people who died last year while receiving childcare in Alberta were Indigenous. And um, if you look at the graph, it, uh, you see that this is happening, you know, year after year after year. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, so um, 
The third major aspect uh, besides residential school and the adoption system is the prison. The, the uh, Indigenous people uh, make up a, a totally disproportionate number in provincial, territorial, and federal custody. And this proportion is actually increasing. So that in 2021, Indigenous adults accounted for about one-third of all adult admissions to uh, uh, provincial or federal custody, yet they were only 5% of the Canadian adult population. And Indigenous youth accounted for one half of youth admissions to custody, while representing about 8% of the youth population. And Indigenous women, there's an even greater over-representation uh, compared with Indigenous men, so that uh, as I said, there's about a third uh, for Indigenous men. The majority of uh, inmates are uh, male, but for women, uh, it uh, by then, 2021, it had risen to 40 or 42 percent. And uh, again, male Indigenous youth were 48 percent, but uh, female Indigenous youth represented 62 percent. And uh, if we look at the sad statistic, so uh, last year uh, we re achieved the dubious statistic of equity. Uh, it, you can see that despite the Indigenous women only being 5% or so of the overall population of adult women, uh, we now up to half of the uh, female prisoners in, in Canada are uh, Indigenous. And you can see the main reason for that actually was uh, COVID. So they released a lot of prisoners uh, early in COVID and continuing, but almost none of those were Indigenous women. They were mostly non-Indigenous women who got released. And that's the main reason for that uh, disparaging statistic. So there's a lot of reasons for these outcome gaps. Indigenous people are routinely classified as higher risk. They're released later in their sentence. They're overrepresented in segregation and maximum security and disproportionately involved in force interventions and self-injury uh, in prison. Uh, so Alex, back to you. Yeah, thanks. Um... So we decided against putting a, oh, can you go back, Malcolm? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Definition uh, for reconciliation. And part of the reason is that everybody who is in that room right now and online um, and us, we're all deciding what reconciliation looks like. And it has to be an active act and um, it, it has to deal with uh, sort of all of the various issues that are uh, going on right now. So next slide, Malcolm. So if people remember, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, made uh, its calls to action public. And in December 2015, as his second official act as Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau committed to the full implementation of the calls to action, um, starting with the implementation of the United uh, Nations Declarations on the, right of, um, in, on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, there are 94 calls to action. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission deliberately made the decision that they want to call them calls to action because they had seen that the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People had made recommendations and recommendations sit on uh, shelves. They don't get actioned. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission made these as calls to action. And there are 94 in total. You can see that seven pertain to uh, health. Um, but there are over half of them that look specifically at reconciliation. And so, again, this is up to all of us to be figuring out what does reconciliation look like and how do we get there. Um, next slide. Uh, so Malcolm showed a slide uh, that showed the death rates of children in residential schools. And this was well known a long time ago, uh, all the way back to uh, Vice, uh, who had uh, been in and touring around. And despite that, 
there were whispers from people who had been in the residential schools that there were even more children who died, children who didn't come home. And um, finally, in July 2021, Kamloops Residential School uh, made the discovery. And so this school was established in 1890. It's out in Kamloops in British Columbia. It was operated by the Catholic Church until 1969. And um, it was once the largest residential school in Canada with its enrollment peaking at 500 students in the 1950s. The federal government actually continued to operate it as a day school until it closed in 1978. And, uh, you know, again, here's a quote uh, that is talking about the object which the government has in carrying on the industrial schools. That's one of the things, that, uh, one of the ways they refer to them. Uh, which is to civilize uh, the Indians, make them good, useful, and law-abiding members of society. Next slide. And so, as I said, in July 2021, that was when the um, announcement uh, came out, and it was the first of many. Um, the uh, Kamloops School had been using ground-penetrating radar and announced that there were 215 unmarked graves that they had uh, discovered. Um, in fact, since then, and uh, this is a list that is showing uh, up to September 26th, uh, you know, what, um, where all they have found uh, unmarked graves. And um, some of them have even been confirmed. Like you see in the first one in Battleford, uh, Saskatchewan, there were 74 that were confirmed back in 1974. And, you know, there are others that are suspected. But in total, there are another 17 sites with over a thousand uh, suspected graves. And um, this is for us something that weighs heavily. You're starting to see um, things in the news about individual First Nations that are making the decision that uh, perhaps it's time now to actually uh, um, go in and um, un uh, unbury these um, graves. Uh, it it's an incredibly difficult decision for everybody involved. And um, we're right now looking to our elders and knowledge holders and so on to understand how to go about this in a good way. Um, next slide. So this um, is the last of our slides, but, but there's more to come. Uh, I We finish with a quote from the author, Thomas King. He's a First Nation uh, Indigenous author. And he summed up the education part of uh, the uh, Indian Act and other things saying, instead of trying to kill the Indian to save the child, North America might have gone into partnership with the various nations and together they came up with an education plan that would have complemented Native cultures and maybe even enriched white culture at the same time. But instead, they chose what we know to focus narrowly on white values, European values, and uh, indigenous values, ceremonies, and languages were considered inferior and had no value or place. So in the uh, opinion of Thomas King, this was the real first abuse of the residential school system. But of course, we know there are many abuses. So we're going to finish with uh, a short dialogue from uh, a Métis knowledge holder uh, whom we know very well, Carrie Lynn Lund, who is uh, one of those survivors of uh, a residential school. And being a residential school survivor, um, it, it really is more than a trigger. It actually makes me feel like that little one in residential school that felt so powerless. And, and it, it, even though I'm far along on my healing journey, it still brings me back to a point where what I saw and what I experienced, I should never have seen, and it should never have happened. And then I think the comments that some people have made to me when we've talked about residential school, and I've, I've, I've been in discussions with them, and they've said, well, that was a long time ago. And I think when we put on an orange shirt, it's not in memorial that we're we're bringing it up. It's that our children are still being harmed. They're still in the system. They're still being apprehended. They're still being um, taken away from 
their families. They're still not being supported. They're still being discriminated against. They're still being, um, you know, there's so much stigma and even lower expectations exist today. And so I think that when as a nation, when as a country, you know, when as a city, when as a, uh, an organization, when we put on orange shirts, are we just going along um, so that we fit in and, you know, oh, that's, that's kind of a fun thing to do? Or, and I'm hoping, is that we're committed to be part of addressing this part of the action that when it comes across our desk when it comes into our life when it when we observe when we hear that we become action oriented and say no that's wrong that's wrong and if every canadian was to get that there would be a difference in voting there would be a difference in policy making. There would be a difference in funding. There would be a difference in attitude. There would be a difference in who we are as a nation. It, there would be a difference in the respect that we have for each other, the understanding. And so orange shirt to me is more than a day that just says, you know, every child matters. Yes, they do. The ones that were not allowed to live their life fully, the ones who lost their lives in the school, the ones who were so broken when they got out that they committed suicide at some point, those who still self-medicate because of the pain and the unresolved grief and the intergenerational impact and all of that, this is still very much alive and, and it is not going to get better by simply pouring money into the problem. It's going to be when people's hearts change towards each other, when people say, no, we won't, we won't be a part of this. We, we won't allow this. We will speak up as social workers, as nurses, as doctors, as neighbors, as you know, in grocery lines, wherever we go, when we see injustice, we'll speak out and we'll be part of that solution. So, Miigwech, thank you. Um, we tried to keep the presentation um, reasonably short so we'd have some time for questions or discussion. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Alexandra and Malcolm. That's actually, uh, you know, very powerful uh, lessons in history. You know, every time uh, uh, we sit with you, uh, we learn something new. Uh, but also, you know, that's uh, actually a fantastic, inspiring um a, a set of reflections, you know, for some uh, someone who actually is a survivor of the uh, uh, residential school system. And um, so I don't know if there are any questions. I certainly have uh, some questions. Any questions from the audience here? Oh, actually, um, I don't know if I can see the uh, questions on the... I see that uh, Rob Beanland has uh, his hand up. Okay. And we're, yeah. we're happy to take comments too. Um, questions, comments. Um, Allison, should I do it from there or? How... Uh, Rob, if you want to go ahead with your question. And... Yes, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate uh, you coming um, virtually to the Heart Institute today and sharing um, the history, which was uh, very. Uh, I learned something for sure. Um, and I also appreciate the comments on the orange shirt day um, that uh, we it has to have meaning. And I completely agree with that. Um, and I think uh, I, I, I'm certain I speak for many of us when we say we will we continue to work and strive for reconciliation. And like you said, Alexandra, you know, to each of us, it means a bit something different, um, but uh, definitely uh, it is, we are trying. 
and I, I can say I'm trying to. Um, I did have some questions about what you think we could be doing different or better in healthcare, uh, more specifically, um, to help uh, move us towards reconciliation uh, and in improving the health for um, our Indigenous peoples and and everyone, as it as it were. I'm wondering if Alex could answer that, but I might start off, Rob, by just saying, I think uh, in the spirit of uh, what Carrie Lynn Lund was talking about and uh, those original treaties of respect is just striving to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people continue to learn from Western knowledge and uh, adopt it. I think it's uh, certainly high time that uh, uh, mainstream uh, people learn from Indigenous and learn to adopt some of the best of the things that we have to offer. Indeed, we're all well. We're all better by listening to each other and gaining from each other's experiences. I completely agree. Yeah, um, Rob, I put in a chat, but I think. It may not be available to everybody, so I'm hoping uh, if it isn't that the IT people can um, post this more broadly. Um, but you could also Google uh, Joyce's uh, principle. And so this is uh, something that was put together following the unfortunate and unnecessary death of uh, Joyce Echequan in Quebec. Um, it is Quebec focused, but in fact, what you are seeing is throughout the country, um, various uh, medical schools uh, and uh, other organizations are really looking at how do we implement this uh, uh, in our own provinces. Um, we have been fortunate to put together a circle of knowledge holders, and these are people that we consider doubly wise. And so they are considered elders or healers or knowledge carriers or, you know, um, medicine people in their own communities. But they also have lived or living experience of uh, heart or heart brain issues. And so Carrie Lynn is one of these people. And so when she's speaking, she is um, bringing in so much wisdom uh, with her words. And um, this group has told us that we really need to uphold Joyce's principle. Um, and they feel that healthcare for Indigenous people, but in fact for all people, will improve as a consequence. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of work in and around cultural safety in the medical system. And I, I think that many of us are doing a good job at trying to provide culturally safe care ourselves. I think that some of the heavy lifting has to come when we're looking at the system overall, because there's this embedded racism that happens. And, you know, how do we take and uh, change systems? And, and that's where uh, I think uh, things get really challenging. Does that help at all? Yes, I think I, I, I agree with you that uh, system change is challenging. Um, you still have you have to connect with the individual um, ex, um, basically acknowledge that we do live in a racist society and, um, and, and that we need to address that head on, uh, collect individually and collectively. Um, and from a system perspective, I agree. Yeah. And, you know, um, Malcolm and I, I think almost anybody, um, indigenous who's working <clears throat> in the healthcare uh, field, um, ends up dealing with racism. And, you know, one of the things that we've discussed is that the racism that Indigenous people experience, I, I'm not pretending it's better or worse than anybody else, but there are particular um, intentions around it. And um, it then is a further uh, tool of colonization or coloniality, if you will. Um, the other thing, and this comes from racism work uh, that uh, our colleagues and the other people have been doing. And that is when you are interacting with the healthcare system, to experience racism there is very different than, let's say, if I happen to be in the grocery store or something, right? You know, and yeah. you know, really thinking about the impact on people. 
And, uh, you know, uh, Joyce Ashikwan was somebody from Quebec. And yet I can assure you, Indigenous people throughout the country felt mm-hmm. that very much, you know, so, yeah. Um, thank, I, you. thank you. Thank um, you. I think we need a lot more of these conversations. Um, I see Rebecca has a question. Um, yeah, On? so um, Rebecca, you want to post the question directly? Rebecca, if you're talking, um, I think you're muted. Um, I... Or if you have trouble, then you can type into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, chat. You know, then we can or Q and A, we can actually pick that up. Yeah. So maybe I can follow up, and I absolutely agree. Uh, you know, the case of. Uh, uh, Joyce and uh, the surprising aspect was that uh, you know in the beginning, uh, you know the hospital and the teams, you know, were all denying that uh, you know there was any uh, racism or discrimination, right? You know, and that, but that's kind of a quite typical. Uh, you know, even I observed that you know in uh, our own and uh, other environments as well. Um, and now the other thing which uh, I have uh, observed, uh, you know, in my just my limited experience uh, um, uh, going to uh, Iqaluit, uh, you know, in Nunavut uh, and uh, working with our, um, with uh, the uh, different, uh, I guess, uh, units, uh, you know, that uh, has uh, interactions with uh, Inuit uh, uh, patients uh, is really the striking aspect of families. You know, it's wonderful to actually see families, you know, coming together and uh, the ability to actually, you know, um, discuss the uh, issues amongst the families and the family unit is really actually a very strong supporting unit. And that uh, seemed to be part of the cultural uh, fabric. Uh, and uh, I think the strength as well, you know, sometimes we kind of miss that even in our own care. And uh, so uh, kind of reflecting on that are two uh, questions. One is uh, uh, in terms of the challenges, you know, for example, of the uh, residential school survivors today, for example, you know, are there ways to connect them, you know, back with the culture, you know, whether that's a uh, identifying families that they lost before or, you know, sort of, or maybe, you know, making new kind of uh, families together. And uh, whether we as uh, health providers could actually find some ways in which we can actually understand better, you know, in terms of how the uh, family cultural bounds, you know, are structured, because I think that's a very uh, important uh, aspect of health, you know, the people now actually identify social isolation, loneliness as kind of the newest, you know, so risk factor, you know, for chronic disease and that we don't really have a good solutions. Yeah, so any thoughts about the, the family aspect and uh, whether that could be part of the solution and part of our learning as well? Um, I can start, Malcolm, and you can maybe fill in. So it's a great question, Peter. Um, for us, families are incredibly important, and I know they are for many other people too. We tend to have a different understanding of families in that um, we have aunties and, um, you know, mushrooms and cookums and, and so on, um, and, and these may or may not actually be blood relatives. Uh, we also are seeing a lot of resilience in people in that they, you know, have their chosen families around them. And so whether it is natural or chosen, I think families are an incredible source of strength. And in fact, um, when we're looking at doing the patient journey mapping that we're hoping to get to fairly soon, uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing is bringing in the shared decision-making. And that is the notion of uh, working with the family, not just the individual patient. And that would obviously be by each patient's choice, not uh, something imposed upon them. Um, the other thing that I think I would say is that we all know that our health is determined much more broadly than just the interactions with the medical system. And so again, the more that we can be 
supporting um, healthy communities around us. I think that that will end up bolstering the individuals within those communities. And so the question about what can we be doing, I think a major component of this is standing in partnership and allyship with Indigenous people as we're trying to put forward our visions of health and wellness and the systems that we need to be um, making that happen. Um, I think the other component is getting involved. You know, um, I, I was looking at um, the National Day uh, of Truth and Reconciliation and a lot of the coverage and they're showing, you know, some sports teams going out to a couple of the reserves. Um, but, you know, uh, did people here actually go out and participate in anything? You know, and if not, why not? And again, as Carrie Lynn was saying, I don't see this as a single day. This is every day. You know, um, there is the Wabano Center. Uh, there are other things right in Ottawa that you could go out and participate in um, community gatherings and so on. And getting to know the community there, them getting to know you and having your face recognized. Um, Malcolm? Um, well, I'd just add, uh, I, that's a very important observation, Peter, that people have made, the importance of uh, families, of relationships, and isolation being a negative factor. And so I think it's one that we all need to bring into the research that we do, whether it's with Indigenous uh, populations or with others, uh, you know, that uh, we have to recognize it's not just all biomedical, and I'm, I'm sure we know that, but uh, to operationalize it. And certainly Indigenous peoples have always had uh, recognized the importance of uh, family relationships. And that was one of the main uh, downsides, uh, faults of both the... Uh, residential school system and the foster care system, uh, breaking up those family connections. And some people manage to overcome it. And people like Carrie Lynn are healthy uh, as uh, elders, but many others didn't manage. Uh, and those ones we need to help, uh, you know, uh, by changing things in the system. Yeah, thanks. Is there is there time? Okay. Hello. Hi, Alexandra and Malcolm. Nice to see you both. Thank you so much for today and for um, you know, sharing that with us. Um, I just I, I have a little bit of um speaking to the terminology that you used in the clear definitions. It struck me throughout your presentation that, you know, the term itself, reconciliation, I feel like I don't think there's anything that how any way you could ever reconcile you know, that really in, unforgivable and, and ex, inexcusable history. And so I'm wondering if you feel that there's a term that and a framework that is better suited to strengthen meaningful allyship than reconciliation as much as um, maybe another kind of framework to, to, to uh, as a term to call it. Well, <laughs> I, it, it's not a single word, but maybe in view of what we were just talking about, reestablishing or reaffirming relationships may be an important thing. It, it, it doesn't quite uh, meet what you are suggesting, perhaps, but it is a very important aspect of reconciliation. It needs to be between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, but also it needs to be within each population. I think uh, we'll all be uh, better off uh, increased wellness if we can reestablish and reaffirm relationships. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a, a great question. And I think we're in some very difficult waters right now. Um, but I go back to the Swinter, the two Rome Wampum Belt. There isn't an exit clause. We're all here and we're going to continue to be here. So we have to figure out how do we be together in a good way. Um, this past weekend, Malcolm and I had the privilege of being with a uh, an elder or knowledge holder from Six Nations. And um, one of the things that she said is that you know, 
she appreciated people introducing themselves as settlers because it's recognizing that they came and sort of who they are. But she also indicated that, you know, she would prefer treaty partners, you know, and recognizing the responsibilities of the treaties and upholding them and participating in them. Um, we work with another elder and, you know, she was saying that for her, an ally is somebody who will take the hit rather than her having to take it again, you know, um, and like some of the stuff that this is what Carrie Lynn was referring to, you know, um, when it crosses your desk or, you know, you're out in public or in the grocery store and you see some injustice, actually stepping up and you would not believe how incredibly um, grateful the people around you would be for that, you know? So I, I think it is really each of us thinking about our own roles and responsibilities, the opportunities that we have and how we can um, make the most of it. And right now reconciliation, like as we all know, the indigenous space is constantly re evolving, but right now we seem to be at reconciliation and, I think that that is something that, you know, we have over 50 uh, uh, calls to action to be working on together. And I think maybe once we get through that, we can start talking about what comes next, you know. Well, thanks, uh, Jody. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, in view of the time, you know, we'll be uh, wrapping up this session, but I just uh, would like to thank again, you know, Alexandra and Malcolm for a fantastic uh, journey that you have actually provided for us. You know, that's a journey back in history. And, uh, but actually more importantly, you know, journey together going forward uh, as uh, partners, as allies. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's a privilege to actually work with you folks. And uh, I'm so glad that, uh, you know, you're part of our uh, kind of research efforts together, but, uh, you know, it's uh, really a learning experience every time, you know, we get together. And I think that's the spirit we want to carry on forward. And uh, so I'd uh, just like to uh, thank you again, you know, on this very important occasion to bring us uh, uh, together to uh, this uh, very important milestone, you know, um, but uh, hopefully this is just the foundation of us uh, creating a great future together. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining us as well. Thank you all.